Hey y'all, welcome back to KB Reads. I have this beautiful background you'll see a little bit later in the video. This has been a hectic second half of the month of June. I have been traveling a lot for work. I spent the last nine days on the road. I'm so excited, I'm headed home today. I have had a great trip, I've had some fun, I've had some adventures, I've done a lot of work. I met a lot of new people, but I'm really happy to be headed home and knowing that I get to see my puppy and sleep in my own bed tonight. But the perk of all this travel is a lot of time to read just because there's there are no other obligations and no house stuff to get in the way. So while I have been adventuring, there's a little bit more time to read in the evenings and of course a little airport time as well. So I read a few more books than average this month and you're gonna hear me talk about all of them. Two of my favorites are towards the end. I'm trying this new thing uh, for this half of the month where I'm gonna chapter it out. So if there are certain ones that you're drawn to, check it out and you can skip to that part of the video. Of course, I always hope you watch the whole thing and I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, so please post those in the comments below. Thank you so much for going on this journey with me. Let's talk about what I've been reading for the second half of the month of June. I'm back home and as promised, I finished another book on the airplane. This one is by Sandra Brown. It's called Seeing Red. A couple of months ago, I won a Sandra Brown book in a Goodreads giveaway, and much to my surprise, pleasantly I might add, when I got the package, it didn't just have one Sandra Brown book in it, it had three or four. So this is one of those. Sandra Brown is a New York Times bestselling author. She's been around forever, and she really is the queen of romantic suspense. She blends those things so well, or at least one of the queens of romantic suspense before you all get mad because I know there's more than one out there. Um, but this is classic Sandra Brown. It's a wonderful story. Kara Bailey is a journalist who really wants this interview. There's this celebrity American hero who did all of the interview things. He was super popular. He traveled around. He really made the most of his fame and fortune. And then one day he just kind of stopped. He gave up interviewing, he became a recluse and stayed home and refused to talk to reporters, which seemed completely crazy because he'd been so loud and vocal for years after the event that made him a hero. And she is determined that she is going to be the first reporter to get him to speak and to break his silence. And she's got a secret that just might help her do that. But in the process of that, it sort of awakened the sleeping beast. The, that event was a crime that he helped save people from. And now that the secret is out, there's some concern that maybe things with that crime were not as cut and dried as were thought, you know, decades ago when it happened. And now it's a top story again. So people are going to start looking into it again. They're going to start asking questions and maybe ticking some people off along the way. In typical Sandra Brown, there's also a love story. There are some steamy sex scenes if you're into that, but in a way that really sort of moves the story forward. It's not just like a trashy romance novel. Not that there's anything wrong with those either. I love me a good trashy romance from now. And again, it's the right thing to read, but overall a highly recommended book. Very fun, a relatively quick read as most of her things tend to be like a few hours an afternoon, a great beach read. A great vacation read, a great read on an airplane like I just did, whatever works for you. Anytime you see Sandra Brown, it's an easy bet to go ahead and pick it up. And I will be reviewing those other books soon, or maybe not soon, when I get to them in my to be read pile. So have you read any Sandra Brown books? What's your favorite? Let me know in the comments below. Doing the background change again, because once again, I'm traveling for work. Uh, you can't see it, but behind you, I have a lovely view of the San Francisco Bay from my hotel room this week. But of course, while I was on the plane and had a little layover, I finished a couple more books. So I'm sorry, I'm a little bit punchy for this video. I have been up for a lot of hours and I'm trying to stay up for a few more because it's 6 p.m. here now and if I go to sleep, I'm gonna wake up way too early, which will probably happen anyway because I do have a three hour time difference and I'm trying to avoid that by staying up or avoid that as much as I can by staying up a little bit longer. I thought I would give this a shot and talk about the two books I finished on the plane. Started some more too, so we'll see how that goes. But the first book I finished while on the plane is called Welcome to the School by the Sea by Jenny Colgan. This is another Goodreads giveaway win. I know you hear me say that a lot. Again, it really totally saves my book budget. Jenny Colgan, I've read a couple of other things by like the bookshop on the corner. 
She's a super fun writer. She lives in Scotland, but she writes kind of chick lit, but stuff that is fun, it's entertaining, and this is no different. This is apparently a re-release of an early book that she wrote back in the earlier 2000s, and she published it under a different name before she became known as Jenny Colgan and became this best-selling author. When she was a kid, she really liked to read stories about girls in boarding school and their different life. And as an adult, those kind of books don't really exist for us. And she really wanted to write for adults and for herself the kind of book that she liked reading as a kid. So this is a re-release under a new title and under her pen name of Jenny Colgan, which is a little bit more well-known. And this is the first School by the Sea novel. It tells the story of four different characters, two students and two teachers at this boarding school in Cornwall, England. One of the teachers, Maggie, is she's been a teacher for a couple of years, but she's from Glasgow, Scotland. She's from a poorer area. She's worked in a rougher school and she's just ready for a change. Her boyfriend and her family are not very supportive, but she goes for this job thinking she'll never get it. She does. So all of a sudden, she's an English teacher in this posh boarding school. We also follow the headmistress, who has a story of her own, and two students at the school. One, Simone, is a scholarship kid, and man, she has studied her butt off to get into this school, to study at this place that rich people go to and to get a scholarship to really further her life and that of her family. And Floss, and Floss's family can afford to pay the tuition, but Floss is furious. She'd rather stay at home than with mom and dad and her friends. Her perfect sister goes to the school and is a prefect this year. She doesn't want to be around her. She doesn't want this change, and she is determined to cause as much trouble as she can and to get as bad of grades as she can so that come Christmas, her parents won't make her go back. So it's really about the journey these four women take. It's each told their own stuff, but it gets a little confusing sometimes about whose story is going. And I don't love some of the representation of Simone, the scholarship student. She's overweight, and there's a lot about, you know, teachers kind of thinking, oh, she'd be so pretty if she lost a few pounds. Or, I mean, kids are mean, right? And the kids there are mean, and they bully her because of her weight. And yes, that happens, and I understand that level of representation. But when it's also having that thought come from teachers about, oh, if only she lost some weight, she'd be cuter. And they're worried about her food intake being like a pathological thing. And I don't love that. It's putting something out there that doesn't need to be out there. But the rest of the story was super fun. It's entertaining. There's a little bit of a love story developing. There's past scandal coming back. There's lessons learned. There's a lot of growth. I would be really curious to read future books in this series. So that's what I can recommend as a good beach read, a little brain break, kind of brain vacation or brain candy, if you will. The other book I finished on the plane is continuing my End of Green Gables reread that I started when I needed those comfort books a couple months ago uh, with Anne of Wendy Poplars. And as you can see, this book has seen some better days. And I noticed this on the plane. I've had this since I was a very small child. But the cover price on this book is $2.95. It has held up for years. It's a little battered. It's a little bruised. But it is still good reading. This one is probably my least favorite of the Anne of Green Gables series. At the end of the last book, spoiler alert, we know that Gilbert proposed to Anne. And she accepted. But he needs to finish medical school. So they decide to work and save for their lives together to build this future that they want while he's in medical school. So Anne accepts a job as a principal at Summerside High School and leaves home to work there with only occasional visits home. Most of the story, I would say probably 90%, is told through a vehicle that Ellen Montgomery has not used in any of the other Anne books, at least not to this extent, where it's mostly told from Anne's point of view as she is writing letters to Gilbert. She writes letters to Gilbert about her experiences, the people that she's met, what's going on. What I don't love is there are no responses. Like, you don't see Gilbert's answers. You don't see her write to anyone aside from Gilbert. And you know she's probably writing to all her other girlfriends. All those characters that we know and love, Marilla, Mrs. Lynde, Diana, they make very, very small peripheral appearances. 
there are no true stories about them. It's just like Anne went home for a weekend and Marilla made dinner or they went and met Diana's baby. All of those character rich things that make the rest of the story so great and future novels so great as well don't really appear in this story as much. It's really sort of like a placeholder or a filler between the events of Anne of the Island and the events of the next book, which is called Anne's House of Dreams. I mean, if you're gonna skip one book in the series, this would be the one to skip. I mean, it's definitely a departure for Ellen Montgomery. She uses some different styles and some different experiments, and that's never a bad thing. I just don't love it in this case. As you can see, I'm still traveling. The next book that I finished reading last night in the hotel room is a little bit of a departure for me. It's unlike anything I've ever read before. It's going to look a little funny when I show it to you. It was another Goodreads giveaway win. You know how much I love those by now. One of the things I really like about the Goodreads giveaways is, honestly, I read anything and everything, so I'm not picky about which ones I enter. I pretty much enter all of them. Through doing that, I've definitely come across some books that I may not have otherwise picked up and read. And this one certainly falls into that category. It's called Aviva versus the Dibook. Book. And I'm really sorry because I'm probably butchering that word. It is a Jewish word or I guess a Hebrew word. Sorry, I blanked on the word there for a minute. This story is strongly representative of Orthodox Jewish culture, which is, which is not something I know very much about. It's interesting in that way to get a peek into a different culture. Again, probably not something I would have picked up on my own just because I don't feel that it's representative of me. But I'm really glad that I did because it was interesting to learn a little bit more about that and to see the community that comes together in this book and to learn a little bit more about those traditions and cultures. I mean, I have Jewish friends, many people do, and this showed me a different side of their religion and their culture that I wasn't aware of. I always like learning new things. It's one of the best reasons, I think, to read a lot. In this story, Aviva is a young middle school aged girl and her father has died. And he died about five years ago, but since her father died, the life her mother and she lead has changed drastically. She's lost friends, they had to move because they could no longer afford the apartment they were living in, and her life is just now small. Her mom has been going through this severe depression because of the loss of her husband that has led to Aviva sort of shutting out the world to some extent because she feels the need to stay home and take care of her mother. Her mother is terrified of Aviva, you know, going out at night or going other places. So Aviva, you know, pretends that she doesn't want those things. It's also really a story about grief and how we handle these traumatic life events. We don't know very much about the father's death for most of the story. It was a traumatic event. Aviva believes it was an accident and, you know, it was, but maybe not as accidental as we would like to believe. And the book is a ghost. It's apparently a Jewish form of a ghost that comes back after death to complete tasks they didn't complete in life. Viva can see this Dibuk in their new home and he sticks to certain areas of it. He really causes trouble. He likes to cause mischief. He, you know, unwraps candies and leaves them all over the floor. He makes messes and Aviva is, feels like she's the only one who can see him and she's the only one that control him, can control him. She really has limited control, but she sees what he's done and she goes after him to clean up. It gets to a point where his mischief is too much for her to handle and other events happen and, you know, they're kind of forced to reawaken and to remake friends and to start looking at what their lives are and what they want them to be. It's a really interesting take on grief as well. It is a young adult novel. There are some hard themes and some hard things in it, but I love that it's representative of groups that we don't usually see and that it doesn't shy away from the hard stuff because we can't do that as a world, as a society. We need to face the hard stuff. We need to talk about it because that's the only way to make it less hard. Overall, especially if you're interested in other cultures, other communities different than your own or representation for Orthodox Jewish communities and others, I would highly recommend picking up this book as, you know, something to really support that and to support more representation in what we read and what is published. What are some of your favorite books about underrepresented groups? Feel free to post in the comments below and maybe I'll pick one to read next month. All right. I'm sure it comes as no surprise, but the next book I finished reading this year was another Goodreads giveaway win. A little bit of it's something different, but by Maria Ampero Escandon. It's called LA Weather. Part of the reason why I picked this one up is because in this particular work trip, I've been in California, so LA, it seemed relatable. This one's been calling my name from the to be read 
list for a while, but other things have sort of grabbed me first. I'm a little disappointed by that because this is a really good book. It tells the story of the Alvarado family. Their father has basically all of a sudden sort of lost himself. Mom calls him a zombie. He sits in front of the TV and watches the Weather Channel 24-7 and no longer engages with his family the way that he used to. They have three grown daughters, the youngest of whom is 28, but still lives at home because they helped her raise her child that was the result of a teenage pregnancy after a sexual assault. The other two, and she, are all very successful career women. They're all married. They all have sort of very different lives that are not necessarily the traditional picture. One day, Grandma and Grandpa are watching two of their grandchildren and a terrible accident happens. This really seems to wake up the family. So this is their story from the year 2016, and it starts in January and just kind of checks in, them, in with them throughout the year. After that tragedy, it was a big awakening. Grandma asks for a divorce from Grandpa, and the adult daughters freak out and ask their parents to give it a year to try to work it out. There's a lot of change. We don't know how things end up in this book. It's very open-ended because it ends at the end of 2016. And you have some ideas and thoughts, but it's really open-ended to what you think is going to happen to them in the future. And my belief is that as long as they have each other, they're going to be okay. Maybe it's not necessarily always the healthiest thing. Maybe it's not traditional in how they see each other, but they each handle life's challenges in different ways. They ask for help or don't ask for help in different ways. So I find it very, very realistic and entertaining to read about, especially in this background of you know, LA weather, it's the title, but what they don't know is how much the LA weather means to their family right now and to what's been going on with their dad and everything else. And all of that sort of comes out in the course of the story as well as some new commitments and some new ideas about directions and what's truly most important. Hey all, new city, another hotel. I've got a gorgeous view of palm trees and desert and some city outside my hotel room window now. Uh, but of course, you know, I had a couple of hours in the airport waiting for my plane and another couple of hours on the plane yesterday. So what did I do? I finished another book. This, you guys, I am not overselling is probably my favorite book that I've read this month. And we're like four days from the end of the month. So I don't think that's likely to change in the next four days. This is another Goodreads giveaway win, but this one is super fun because I won it and read it before the publication date. This comes out on July 5th, just in time for those summer vacations. And again, highly recommended. It is First Born by Will Dean. This was just super cool. It's a British psychological thriller that starts in London, but mostly takes place in New York City. Twin sisters, Molly and Katie, have lived together their whole lives and basically done everything together. Katie lets her twin know that she's decided she's going to go to New York City to pursue her master's. And Katie is vivacious. She's outgoing. She's full of life. And Molly is a little bit different. Molly is afraid of everything. She researches. She's a little paranoid. You know, she knows everything that could go wrong. She knows safety stats and this and that. Their parents are over in New York visiting Katie when Molly gets a phone call. Katie didn't show up for dinner and they went to her apartment to find her and find out what happened and found her dead in her bed. Very few marks on her, no clear signs of what happened, but it's being treated as a homicide. Molly does her research. She gets on a plane and flies to New York to be with her parents during this ordeal and begins on her own to investigate the death of her sister and her sister's life in New York to find out what's going on and what happened to her. This other half. She says it all the time. She's more than my sister. She's the other half of me. Not even the other half. She's an extension of me. And that's what this is all about. This thriller as she investigates, there are twists and turns that you don't expect. There are a couple that definitely caught me by surprise. And I love this kind of novel, but I usually figure them out. So the fact that there were just twists that I was like, whoa, in this one was <laughs> really cool. I'm pretty sure I gasped audibly on the plane a couple of times. Go pick this one up. Highly recommend. It comes out next Tuesday. Pre-order. Go to your local bookstore and find a copy. Do whatever you have to do. But I highly recommend First Born by Will Dean as your next read this summer. Once you pick it up, I want to hear what you think. And what are some of your favorite psychological thrillers that have twists and turns that you didn't expect? 
another new background. I mean, is it a beautiful night if you can't see that behind me? I am finally headed home tomorrow, which I'm super excited about. It's been a super fun trip, but I did just finish one more book that I'm gonna leave behind me. This one was another Goodreads giveaway win, and it's one that I'm surprised that I liked as much as I did. It's called Wired for Love by Stephanie Cacioppo. This is gonna be a tough book to talk about. The tagline is a neuroscientist journey through romance, loss, and the essence of human connection. Stephanie Cacioppo is a neuroscientist who has spent her entire career researching the neuroscience of love. She's done that convinced that she's destined to be single for life until one day she's at a conference and she and this neuroscientist sitting next to her meet eyes they banter they run into each other again later it becomes this whirlwind long distance romance that ends in them falling madly passionately in love getting married well stuff happens but i don't want to spoil anything but it turns out that this man that she fell head over heels in love with conversely while she's been studying the neuroscience of love He's been studying the neuroscience of loneliness. In some ways, their research was really partnered really well because it was kind of opposites, uh, which is something that she talks about. They have this wonderful life experience. So while she's talking about the science of love and the neuroscience behind love and loneliness, she writes about it in a way that is accessible. It's very readable. It's a really a page turner. Make it even more rich. She applies the science to the experiences that she and her husband shared in falling in love and what came after that. That not only makes this accessible, very, very readable, but it makes it human, which is something that you don't often find in a science nonfiction book. I found it really fascinating, really illuminating, and definitely something I would highly recommend picking up and looking more into. She's a great writer. As I said, it's very readable, very accessible highly recommended. If you do pick it up, I hope you will let me know what you think in the comments down below. What are some of your favorite nonfiction books that you were surprised to like? I'd love to hear about those too. Last night I was so exhausted from just everything. I've been on the road for eight days that instead of going adventuring, I decided to order room service, stay in, read a book. I actually finished the book last night because I did nothing else and this book, I know it doesn't seem like it, but I do buy books. If there's a favorite local bookstore here I found on a business trip back in October that I visited, they shipped all the books home, so I'll share the book haul when I get there. But I do buy books in addition to, you know, winning them, finding them in a little free library, borrowing them from friends. And a couple of years ago for Christmas, my sister gave me a membership to Book of the Month Club, which if you don't know about it, it's kind of cool, but every month they curate a list of five or six new releases that they really believe in. Around the first of every month, you get like a ding from the app that's like, go choose your book for the month. They span all kinds of genres, really something for everyone. So you can pick something for that month and then it shows up at your house a few days later. Or if nothing from that month appeals to you, you can kind of look at the backlist and choose an add-on instead, or you can bank the credit for a future month. The book that I read last night was actually my May book of the month pick, and it was called Part of Your World by Abby Jimenez. Um, Abby Jimenez is apparently a celebrity chef. I like to cook. I watch all those funky cooking shows, and I've not heard of her, but it says that she is a Food Network winner and best-selling author and founded Nadia Cakes out of her home kitchen in 2007, um, which Nadia Cakes are mentioned in the book once or twice, not in a way that it's promotional. This is a romance first and foremost, but it's about this woman who's a doctor. She's got a long family legacy to live up to. She's coming home from a funeral and gets in a little bit of a car accident, ends up in a ditch and towed out by this man that of course, she falls for but it's a big struggle because not only do they come from vastly different backgrounds they have vastly different lives and they are both firmly entrenched in the areas in which they live so really figuring out priorities what's important the female protagonist has been the victim of a abusive relationship not physically abusive like we usually read about but more emotionally and mentally abusive and manipulative and she's just coming out of that and figuring that out and starting to see that in other areas of her life and how that really impacted her so being able to open and trust love again and just figure things out and you know shake up what she always expected and thought of herself she's in a lot of ways very sheltered very naive 
doesn't know how to take care of herself, whereas this younger man that she's met seems to have a lot of stuff together, but he struggles with money. He's just not from a place where there's a lot of it to go around and there are things that he wants that cost a lot of it. Because of that, there are a few things that I saw coming in the book that didn't happen, which truly really surprised me. I love that. I will tell you though that there's a baby goat in pajamas, there's a pig named Kevin Bacon who doesn't love kind of quirky things like that. I found myself laughing, I cried a little bit, just could not put this book down, finished it last night, stayed up a little bit too late to finish that. That's all good because what I'm doing today is mostly flying home. So with this and Firstborn, definitely my favorite books of the month of, Ju of June. We're still in June. Go check them out. What are some of your favorite like fun, quirky romances? Post those in the comments below. I'd love to hear about them. And as I should have guessed, I did finish another book on the plane, mostly because of a flight delay, uh, where we were sitting on the tarmac for an hour while they were getting all of the bags loaded on the plane. So that was interesting. But I'm so happy to be home, even if I am exhausted, have my dog back to snuggle with. I did want to tell you about this last book for the month of June because tomorrow starts July. This book was, surprise, surprise, another Goodreads giveaway. I came home to a stack of half a dozen of them. They're not going away anytime soon. Again, save my book budget. I love it. This one uh, was called The Windsor Knot by S.J. Barrett. Bennett, sorry, S.J. Bennett, The Windsor Knot. It came out last year, so I actually won it like a year ago and it just made it to the top of my to be read pile, sort of. I didn't love it. The tagline across the top, and this is supposed to be the first book in a new series, is Her Majesty Investigates. It's set in England. The premise is that Queen Elizabeth, like the real Queen Elizabeth that's over in England now, is a bit of an amateur investigator and in that she likes to solve crimes. And it comes out that she has a long history of this. She does it sort of sneakily, where she uses her horses to talk to experts. She apparently is very good at noticing things and has great instincts. Once she figures out what happened, she manipulates others into actually solving the crime and getting the credit so that they still trust her and they don't think that she has been doing this and manipulating all of these things. The Archbishop of Canterbury is in here. David Attenborough is in here. It's a little crazy because it's all the real life celebrities and politicians. The Obamas make an appearance. It's set in 2016, so that's why they're on a state visit there. That's actually why I really didn't buy into this novel. I really struggled with the fact that we were talking about Queen Elizabeth, that we were talking about real life politicians and celebrities in this completely fictional account where all this stuff is happening. Like a body was found in Windsor Castle and now the Queen is investigating this murder through third parties. I think I would have bought in more had it been a fictional queen in a fictional world and not layered on top of all of the things that we see in news, media, and pop culture about the people that actually appear in this book. There are other characters that of course are fictional and I found those parts of the story much easier to buy into and understand. Overall, this is not my favorite. It's probably not one I would pick up. I'm not gonna read any other books in the series. Not my cup of tea at the end of the day, but to each his own. That's one of the things I love about reading is there's something for everybody. And just because I don't love something doesn't mean that you won't or other people won't because we're all different and that's part of the fun and the joy of it, right? My last question for you this month is this. I mentioned that this has been in my to be read pile for a year. I'm sure there are things that have been in there longer and some things that I get that get read right away. So how do you pick what to read next out of your to be read pile? I definitely don't go in order and I'm curious what methods you use. Let me know in the comments below and maybe next month I'll talk about what I do too. So there you have it. I think you got a lot of variety from me this month. I read a little romance, a little mystery, a little fantasy and fantastic stuff with the ghosts. I read some chiclet. I read some nonfiction. I know some people have commented that I seem to have been reading a lot of fiction lately and that's true. I do also read a fair amount of nonfiction. I've just been in a fiction kind of mood so you can always pretty much expect a wide variety from me and what I've got going on, what I've been reading, depending on what's up. Um, you'll probably see some professional books coming up as well, some other fun things, and that book haul when I get home and get my book mail that I sent myself, which is kind of fun and exciting and goofy. Didn't buy as much as I wanted to, but definitely more than I would have if I had had to carry it all home. Danger Will Robinson when they say, oh, we can just ship that all for you. Anyway, thank you guys so much for joining me on this journey. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, 
Trek. I'm big fans of all of them. Please put it in the comments below and let me know some of what you've been reading. I'd love to hear your favorite book that you read during the month of June. Put that in the comments below too. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Click on the little bell so that you get notifications when I post future videos. And I can't wait to see you next time. Until then, keep reading.